I've known Michael for, uh, you know, a few years now. And um, he, he's, he's been a bit of a mentor to me. And, you know, just tonight, uh, he builds my confidence a lot because sometimes I, you know, suffer from shyness. And, uh, <laughs> and just tonight I said to him, gosh, you know, what a great group. And Clark, you introduced everybody so, so nicely. It's very impressive, all of you. And I asked Michael, what, what on earth could I say to you that would be interesting? And he said, he looked at me very seriously, and looked right in the eye, as he tends to do right now. And he says, Bill, whatever you do, do not try to be intelligent, insightful, or charming. Instead, just be yourself. <laughs> so he's really built up my confidence tonight. And, and um, you know, I, I've got a few things I want to go through, which I think, um, are a kind of a vehicle for creativity. And, and I'm gonna do it very quick, uh, because you know, MTV, right? Short attention span, I'm here to say we invented the short attention span. It wasn't, it wasn't Twitter, no matter what Twitter says. It was us who invented that short attention span. <laughs> I love Berlin, and I love this school, and I know you're not all from Berlin, some of you are, but um, this is a, actually an amazing, amazing city, and which I wanna to get to in a second, but um, I love the school. The school's fantastic, and I, I love being an ambassador for the school. I think the mission um, is, it, it always gets uh, resonance when I talk to somebody about the mission of this school. And I always like to say, you know, it's much, much easier to teach business skills to a creative person than the reverse. The reverse is almost impossible. Now, I don't say a, a lot, but I, I feel that way. I think it's, um, creativity is, it, it comes from inside. It's hard to train in creativity. It's hard to teach creativity. You are creative, which is wonderful. And now we're just, you know, now you're just layering on the business skills, which most of you know anyway, but it just helps speaking the language. So Berlin, why do I love Berlin? Well, um, I learned from um, the taxi driver tonight from the airport that um, the airport's not working yet, so there's, you know, a few difficulties. and. Uh, one of my heroes, Klaus Wolverite, you know, first openly gay mayor. We all know that. He came out before his election even. And he's great. I love him. But he has this quote about Berlin, poor but sexy. I'm sure you've heard that before. Um, if you haven't, that's what he says. That's what he has said about Berlin. Because it doesn't have the industry and the manufacturing, but it has this cool factor. And not only the West, of course, but East, especially the East. And for me, this city, and, and while I was with MTV for almost a quarter of a century, uh, it was a real source of influence, Berlin. We, we put a lot of our, our most important creative people in Berlin because we knew it was a source of influence worldwide. Uh, we call it a source of cool. Berlin is a cool city. And, um, you know, um, one of the things that we pride ourselves with MTV is we hired, just like this, hired a lot of people from around the world. And we celebrated the, the diversity and um, I, I I never did call a karaoke a Paulista. That was a, <laughs> a sin, but uh, you know, we'll forgive that. Um, but what I always liked uh, at MTV is that we worked hard and we play hard. And I, um, I actually encouraged a lot of dating. And uh, you know, so dating leads to, well, you know. Um, and uh, so there were actually marriages at MTV. And I am one of those marriages. I married someone from MTV, and I survived my HR department. I didn't get fired by <laughs> HR. <laughs> I'm very, very happy to hear. Um, I've enjoyed my relationship with both Michael and Clark over the years. It's, it's really, um, you're in good hands. You have terrific leadership here at the school. And uh, this is why I enjoy being an ambassador for the school. But it, let me go back to Berlin for a second, because um, there's a lot of important cities around the world. And at MTV, we decided to um, have creative centers um, in Milan design. Uh, and we also uh, went to BA, sorry about uh, San Paulo, um, and then uh, Tokyo. But we actually got a creativity from all these great cities around the world. But Berlin has this, um, oh, I don't know, it's a power of history. And it has uh, symbols. It has the Brandenburg Gate, it has the Berlin Wall, of course, it has the Reichstag. But I'm a big believer in symbols, and Berlin stands for a lot. So I'm gonna tell a little story about Berlin because whenever I do, I can't resist. But it has a purpose, the story. So um, Berlin, for me, connected my former life to my current life in many ways, and, and actually in a very, very dramatic way, because a long, long time ago, I commanded nuclear missiles as part of NATO. 
And um, I didn't tell anybody that, well, that to anybody when I was at MTV because the nuclear missiles are, you know, not very rock and roll. Um, and each missile was, you know, was huge, was much bigger than was ever used before. So these were, you know, lethal weapons. And this was during the Cold War, the 70s, and, and um, it was bipolar, the United States and the Soviet Union. And we had an acronym, you may, might have heard of it, it's called MAD, which is Mutually Assured Destruction, and many people credit that philosophy as preventing a war, largely during the 45 years of the Cold War. It was a very appropriate acronym. acronym. So I did that um, a long, long time ago, and then I came to Europe in 1989, January of 1989, to command a whole different type of unit. It was MTV, MTV Europe at the time. And in many ways, believe it or not, MTV Europe or MTV was more powerful than the nuclear missiles. Now, it didn't have the force. It didn't have the blunt force, but it had the power. So what, what do I mean by that? Well, I, I, I made a, um, as you often do when you become a CEO, you make some of your most important decisions in the first 30 to 90 days. And that's the time for change. So I, I made what I thought, and think now in hindsight, was my most creative decision. And what was that decision? It, it also was a business decision, but first and foremost, it was creative. In 1989, there was no cable. You were talking about it, Michael. There was no cable infrastructure, so MTV had to be distributed. So what did we do? We went on a totally new satellite, which was called KU, which enabled you to get a dish, we call it direct to home. You didn't have to wait for cable. You had a dish from the, from the sky, uh, 23,000 miles up, that suddenly enabled you to get channels, MTV being one of them. It was very expensive. I had to convince my board to do this. But then I made the second creative decision, and, and we went on the bird, we went on the satellite in January of 1989. The second decision was I decrypted it. I put it in clear which is, it doesn't happen nowadays. You always pay for the access to the channel. So I put it in clear. Now, why did I do that? I just wanted MTV to be in front of as many homes as possible. I forego the rev. I went, you know, we, the board asked me why was I doing this. I, I, I didn't uh, capitalize on the revenue. I just wanted to get the brand out, build the brand as strong as possible. And it was the first time that anything like this has been in the clear. So the ama something amazing started happening, which is behind, at the time, the Iron Curtain, uh, it, it was the first time that people saw MTV or any television, really, from the West. And, uh, you know, obviously there was no internet, no phones, no, uh, there was a lot of state TV, which wasn't quite as interesting. So when you got a dish, it drew a lot of attention. So word of mouth started happening, people started from Poland actually sending uh, telegrams back to the States to get money, $1,000 at the time to get a dish. So dishes started popping up everywhere behind the Iron Curtain, and we actually had more distribution behind the Iron Curtain than we did in the West in these early days of MTV. Now, so we had all these dishes, and please, it's obvious MTV did not bring the wall down, but uh, it was more Gorbachev, and Thomas, you're here, you work with the Gorbachev. Where's Thomas? Just raise your hand wherever you are. He works very closely with Gorbachev. I believe Gorbachev, when he ordered the troops not to fire, was the person most responsible. He was responsible for the Warsaw Pact soldiers, so they all listened to him. They did not fire. That was the most important reason. But technology did play a part, and when people saw the programming, it, to me it wasn't so much about the programming, it was more about the commercials. When you saw the commercials and you were, you know, didn't have access to that, you say, wow, that's how they live? Hmm, I want to do that. So uh, <laughs> they realized they were missing something. And, and I believe technology played a really important role in that peaceful change that has become very historic. I also feel the same about technology in Arab Spring. You know, we talk about Twitter and Facebook. Al Jazeera had a similar effect, I think, two years ago during Arab Spring. So I, I happen to be in the East wherever East is, sorry, <laughs> who knows East, that way. Um, when the wall came down, it was a very, I was there all week, it was very exciting. I was there to hook up MTV in these hotels because I was speaking, and uh, we had no idea this was gonna happen. We felt the excitement and the energy, but when it finally happened, it was like, wow, of course, and it was totally unexpected. So my life literally went from missiles to music, it went from, oh, I don't know, the Iron Curtain to the red carpet, it went from the DMZ to the MTV, and the immense force of the missiles, in my mind, could not do what the power of technology 
and music and commercials could do. So what did I do with this moment in history? I decided to use it as a vehicle for the company. And I made it um, an inspiration vehicle, if you were, because MTV Europe was bringing people together in Europe, as corny as it sounds, and we were about unity. So I decided to make this happening um, overcome what at the time was a very dubious business plan. The business plan had no business to work. And this is a, a good point, I think, why I think execution is so important. Execution can overcome a bad business plan. It, it, and, and likewise, bad execution can overcome a good business plan. We had a bad business plan. Why was it bad? Because we were doing a program across different languages, at different cultures, and we depend on advertising that never ever advertised across Europe. One of my favorite quotes I heard from an advertiser was, I've never met a pan-European. <laughs> and it's true, there was no such thing. So we, did, we had a flawed business. And, um, and this was you know, well before the Euro. And, and, uh, but we used this reunification, if you will, this you know, 89 wall came down and on, the, on the way to reunification of Germany. And we looked to this, um, this unity, if you will, um, and made it part of Europe, MTV Europe, uh, this little old music channel. And it became our mission. It became our war cry, really, more than a mission. And so my mantra became breaking down barriers. And I gave out pieces of wall to you know, all of the, uh, the people of MTV. And, and it was a symbol of our unique ability to connect different people, different countries, different cultures. From that moment, believe it or not, we were on our way based on a creative decision. So then, yeah, that was 89, we came back in 94 and did our very first Europe Music Awards, which is, uh, we're having um, also the 20th one next week in Amsterdam. And uh, that was our first in 1994. It was five years to the, to the day when the wall came down. We built the largest tent ever constructed at the time, little old MTV, we didn't know what we were doing, in the east facing Brandenburg Gate and as the curtains drew and the world was watching the show, George Michael came up and sang Freedom. And in Freedom, it's got this line about the boys of MTV. So, you know, we're reached a tipping point now. It's all sort of happening, you know, the Freedom thing. And then um, fast forward, we came back again in 2009 for the 20th anniversary. And uh, this was a big thrill for me because Gorbachev was here, obviously, to celebrate the, the uh, anniversary. Once again, we never came back to a city twice, but once again, we came back to Berlin in 2009, we came back to the Brandenburg Gate and we had U2 because Mayor Wolverite said, oh, I'll give you the Brandenburg Gate if you bring me U2. So of course we brought U2, he gave us the Brandenburg Gate and they sang one, which was, the, which was their anthem for uh, so many things. And it was a very powerful moment. I ended up giving Gorbachev our Free Your Mind Award for doing what he did, peacefully bringing the wall down. I now have a two and a half ton section of the wall somewhere in Berlin. And I, I tell all this because those three incredible moments, 89, 94, and 2009, really came from one creative decision, believe it or not. And it was in the first 90 days of my, of my, of my gig, uh, very early in the product life cycle of MTV. So I literally saw my life going from missiles to music and force, the blunt force, to real power. And we turned this struggling channel with a struggling business plan into the largest network of channels in the world. 200 channels, 200 countries, 20 different brands with an audience of 2 billion. I believe creativity is a key success factor for anything, and certainly business. But problem solving is such an, uh, an important challenge, especially now with all the problems the world has, that we need creative solutions. Now, at MTV, I was lucky because I was surrounded by creativity all the time. And it was, it was really a, a, a quite a sight to see. And we had to keep reinventing ourselves because that's what you have to do with any product. And um, product innovation became really important. We had to have more choice, so we kept launching all these brand extensions. But I, I think creativity is also very important in business decisions. And most people don't give it enough credit, not only in the creative side, but also in the business side. Now the world, you know, I don't have to tell you, climate change, water shortages, um, global health, which I work a lot on, disparity of wealth, poverty, uh, clean energy, the list goes on. We need creative solutions. And this is why I think creativity is so, so important. And this is why I think your background is such a tremendous asset. And I congratulate you for being here and celebrating that 
wonderful skill that you have and learning even more to build on it. Now, I spent the better part of the next 20 years on building this global business, it's in the book, country by country, painfully traveling everywhere. And I had a very simple strategy, and, and it was really three things. It's just really almost too simple. Number one, distribution everywhere. I wanted MTB to be in every home in the world, and I had a mantra, I always had sound bites, and this one was aggressive, creative, relentless. So I had the whole team making sure we had distribution as everywhere we could, every country. Number two, going local. This was sort of my thing. Not one burger, not one cola. I wanted the product to be different in every country. And I had a mantra, respect and reflect. And we pioneered this. Now everyone sort of does it, uh, some better than others, but we pioneered this. And I like to say we were local before local was cool. Number three, realized early on that we had to use this amazing distribution and vertical connection for more than just playing music videos and reality programming. So we wanted to seamlessly deliver important messages on the channel. Not easy to do because you can't preach, obviously, to young people. So that was the third mantra. Doing good is good for business. And what do I mean by that? Well, um, I talk to businesses all the time. Do, do something that's good. Pick an issue. Do it for your customers. If you're Coca-Cola in Africa, you want to protect your cu customers from AIDS. Um, do it for your own employees because they'll feel much better about coming in. The morale will be higher. They'll feel better about working there. Productivity will increase. If you don't believe either one of those, and some businesses don't, do it for your brand. Do it for your brand because it'll make your brand more successful. Doing good is good for business. Now, just in case we're all taking this too seriously, in this world of respect and reflect, remember that I also brought the world Jersey Shore, thoughtful, sensitive, thought-provoking, intelligent programming. I also, my favorite, Beavis and Butthead, uh, distributed almost everywhere, and of course, Jackass. Now, um, I made sure about Jackass because uh, we always pride ourselves as being on the technological forefront, so it wasn't just Jackass, it was Jackass 3D. You know, just, just to be sure. So, uh, yeah, we had, we had a little bit of that as well. Now, uh, I finally left MTV two years ago, after this nearly quarter of a century, and I had dinner with Bill Clinton. Sorry to name drop, we do that a lot at MTV. And um, he gave me advice over dinner. I said, you know, I'm, I'm leaving MTV, I'm retiring. He said, wow, that's great. I said, why? He said, because now you can finally say anything you want, what you've always wanted to say. And he paused, and I'm thinking, that's pretty cool. And then he said, but the worst thing is, no one's going to care what you say. <laughs> <laughs> so I did what any self-respecting CEO would do. I wrote a book. <laughs> and then the second thing I did, I decided to devote my life to global health. And so the majority of my time now is with various global health issues. There's about eight of them. And I'm going to just take you through a couple of them. I, I work as an envoy for GAVI, which is the Global Alliance Vaccination Immunizations. And uh, I was just in Stockholm last week. I'm in Cambodia next week um, for GAVI. I also work with the UN still as an ambassador, goodwill ambassador for um, HIV and AIDS. I continue to work for the foundation that we started at MTV called MTV Staying Alive. And then I joined AMFAR, which is a research um, entity um, Elizabeth Taylor founded it, Sharon Stone's very active in it now, Kenneth Cole runs it, searching for a cure. And then I also work for the Goldie Hawn Foundation and the Barbara Bush, the younger, um, the daughter of George Bush. And uh, so that really occupies the majority of my time. Now I'm just going to spend a few minutes on a couple because these are really, I think, terrific stories. Gabe, Global Alliance of Vaccines and Immunizations, Bill and Melinda Gates' first big initiative started in 2000 at Davos and to this day it's their biggest. They're in the 50 poorest countries of the world, and they give vaccines to children below age five. Very simple premise. In the first 10 years, from 2000 to 2010, they gave out vaccines to 250 million children, quarter of a billion, and saving, calculated, they saved five and a half million lives. Unbelievable results. They're in a midterm review now of a second five-year plan that is going to vaccinate another 250 million children and save another 4 million lives. So by 2015, 
they'll, Gabi will have saved 10 million lives. It's, it's quite extraordinary. And uh, mega money is involved. It's not just Bill and Melinda Gates. All donor countries from around, around the world contribute. But I'm drawn to Gabi because it takes uh, elements from business. And uh, on the creativity side as well as just the pure business side. And so why is that? Well, number one, it's guaranteed results. You, you give a vaccine, you save a life. Really clear cut. Um, it has excellent ROI because for the price of a coffee, you save a life. That's how much a vaccine costs. It introduces this amazing scale by having so many vaccines, you reduce the cost from like $100 to around $250. And, uh, and that scale enables many more vaccines to be produced, of course. It builds health systems in the local countries, which is critical to getting the vaccines out. It gives equity because this is a stat that I never knew before, but typically when a new vaccine is introduced, it would take 15 years, believe it or not, to get to a developing country from a developed country, so it provides equity. It has KPIs, it has benchmarks, it has dashboards. It's run like a business, but it's still missing what they call the fifth child because 80% are vaccinated, but 20% are the hardest to reach in the most far away areas, and it's very, very hard to reach those places. Depending, depends on supply chain, cold chain, et cetera. And developing vaccines is very complicated. It takes literally hundreds for each vaccine, hundreds of employees, years of research, a lot of raw materials, and a very long lead time. But the technology, and this is something that's really crucial, because we have all these problems in the world. Technology in vaccines is so powerful, it's magical. New vaccines are coming out all the time. So we, Gave, is launching pneumococcal, which is pneumonia, kills about a million children a year, and rotavirus, which is simply diarrhea. But because you don't have access to, to clean water or replenish your, um, system, your uh, body in um, um, community health care centers, you're way in the middle of nowhere, you die. A child can die in oh, I don't know, less than three, three days. So there's, the good news is there's a vaccine that prevents both rotavirus and pneumococcal. Hep B and um, HPV are uh, two viruses that cause cancer. And this is something that's gonna be magical going forward because the projection is that there'll be many more cancers that have, are identified from viruses. Scary thought, but actually a good thing because you can develop, develop a vaccine to prevent it. So we're rolling out, we've rolled, rolled out HB, Hep B already and HPV. Cervical cancer is the biggest cancer killer of women in the developing world because there's no screening. So this is really an important rollout and the good news again is it's a vaccine that's developed to prevent cancer. Massive scale for Gavi, 2.4 billion, not million, doses have been given to date, one fifth of those in this year alone. So the scale up has become really accelerated. New vaccines are coming all the time. We expect malaria very soon. And we expect 13 vaccines in the one. We expect one vaccine for all the different influenza uh, viruses. So this is really a, a very exciting development that a lot of people haven't heard of, but I think you'll hear a lot more in the future. Second one, just quickly, AMFAR, searching for a cure for AIDS. There's no cure. And, um, but they're about to launch something called the Countdown to Cure, because for the first time in the 30-year history of AIDS, there is a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel because just in the past year, there have been three cases of what we call clinically cured. In practical solutions, but still clinically cured. One was right here in Berlin, had a complete transfusion of blood. We call him the Berlin patient. Number two, earlier this year, the Mississippi baby, where mother to child transmission, the baby had HIV. They load it up on treatment right away, which they often, which they really often cannot do because it hasn't been identified. Loaded up so much on treatment in the first 72 hours that she was clear of HIV nine, uh, six months later. And then in Boston, there was a stem cell experiment that looks like it's clinically cured HIV. So these are all impractical solutions right now with the exception of maybe number two, loading up treatment for early, um, for, uh, early diagnosis, but there's enough evidence now that you can focus the research. The research in the past has been like a flashlight in a dark room, you know, looking for the solution in this virus and it, it, it hides in reservoirs. Now it can be technologically 
focused. So we're, at AMFAR, we're very excited, not overly optimistic. We define cure as stop taking ARVs, very important because ARVs do have side effects, living normal, healthy life, and no transmission to others. And we think at AMFAR that that's very possible. We haven't named a date yet, but we're gonna name a date pretty soon on when we think that'll happen. The third one, staying alive. So what is staying alive? Well, it's about staying alive, actually. And it's not the only thing that MTV does. There's a whole bunch of social issues that MTV uh, tackles, but this is really the signature one that MTV does worldwide. And uh, it's two things. It's the campaign. It's everything from a 30-second spot to a 90-minute movie on the air, uh, hitting the most vulnerable demographic affected by AIDS because half of all new infections are below 25. And then we layered on that um, a foundation. And uh, we just had a big event Saturday night to raise money for the foundation because what the foundation does is give grants to young leaders around the world, we're up to 440 in 70 countries, that tackles the epidemic at a grassroots level. So it complements the campaign where we get you know, literally hundreds of millions of viewers with what we think is even more effective at the grassroots level. And uh, you know, we're very, very excited about the foundation. Uh, it's still mainly prevention and stigma. It's, it's not that complicated. But because of our reach and because of the vertical connection, we think we're best, best positioned to do this. And prevention, until there is a cure, even though we have some hope with AMFAR, is the best. Prevention is the best cure. Stigma is the other thing that we tackle, prevention and stigma. And stigma is, of course, you know, terrible. It's a particularly insidious part of the disease. Um, and why and the tangible effect of stigma, of course, is that people don't get tested uh, because of the discrimination. And so we have a, a still a very large population of, of um, young people with HIV that don't get tested. You should get tested because the treatment will stop the prevention and it has a, a spiraling effect for all for the positive. So we're working on that. We're doing apps with testing centers. We're doing programming in, in uh, Kenya and most of the hard hit areas. Uh, that star the, the uh, people uh, cast from the respective country uh, so it can relate and we seamlessly put it in the program so it gets very high viewing but it also has an effect in behavioral change and that's that's the beauty so you're less likely to have multiple partners you're more likely to uh, be tested you're more likely to have condoms you're more likely to even do circumcision um, in Africa which is one of the programs so we're doing this even though um, AIDS has fallen off a little bit from the radar screen because there have been some downward movement in the numbers, but that's a problem because of complacency. So we're really working very, very hard to fight complacency, not stopping until this epidemic has been halted. Now, um, just my other activities, education. I work with Westminster College, um, which is where Churchill defined the Iron Curtain, by the way, Baruch University, which is first generation um, graduates, uh, the American School of London, and of course, this school. And this is my favorite. I'm here to say <laughs> the Berlin School of Creative Leadership. And one of my favorite topics is disruption. And I would love to talk to um, you about how you feel about disruption in the education world. I'm working on a second book. I also work in the private sector with a, about six different initiatives, private equity. A company called Zumba, by the way, is looking for creative directors. The bad news is you gotta go to Miami. What's so bad about that? But uh, if you're interested, come see me. They're, um, it's a great company that's uh, on the march and it reminds me of MTV in the early days. So as my career has been, uh, you know, with the Berlin story, you can get an example, very unconventional. You know, to go from, uh, I, they said missiles to music, a, a bit uh, unpredictable. Um, so I'm a big believer in adaptation and um, adaptability, and um, Darwin said it's not about the, the survival of the fittest, it's about the survival of the most adaptable. Everything that it defined my life didn't exist when I was graduating from college. And I know you're beyond college, but it's the pace of change. I think you will find things that may define your life. I know you're beyond college, of course, that aren't, doesn't even exist now because that's how quickly things are changing. I like to quote Mike Tyson, one of my favorite uh, <laughs> leaders in the boxing world. Everybody has a plan until you get hit. Um, more and more ad ad adaptation is gonna be key, I believe. And um, so I'm gonna close 
because I never want to miss an opportunity when I'm talking to such a great group of people to do like my little top 10 of tips. You've heard much of them before, and, uh, but they still hold true. So here they go, MTV style. Number one, passion, love what you do, do what you love. It's okay to have detour, but just keep coming back to what you really, really want to do. Life's too short otherwise, and you have too much stress. You'll have much less stress if you're doing something that you really, really want to do. Number two, yes, think global, but really, really connect local. And, uh, you know, I'll quote Bono and one, we are all different but one, we are all one but different. Um, travel, travel, I say, is a cheap education with no homework. And when I say travel, often in the business world, we go from the plane to the conference room to the hotel, or the hotel, in this case, <laughs> I'm doing it in that order. Gotta be out in the city or the country where you are and really feel the culture. It's so important to stay curious. Number three, take risks, break rules. I like to say it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. And uh, that was one of the things we tried to instill at MTV. I believe innovation only happens with risk. You learn more from failure than you do from success. So when you're managing these operations, I know you take creative risk all the time, but when you're managing now business operations, keep that in your culture. I think it's, it's critical to always stretch yourself and encourage risk. Not easy, particularly when you get higher at, in, as a CEO. Number four, leadership. Set the example, and um, you know, there's many different ways to do that. I have a military background, so I say first on the battlefield when there's a crisis, and invariably there is. First on the battlefield, last one to leave. Quick to take blame, slow to take credit. It goes counterintuitive in the business world. Accountability is leadership. Too many leaders do not take accountability. Number five, keep the principle of hard work. It's kind of gone away a little bit with all the economic crises we've had now. But I find the harder I work, the luckier I am. And I really stress execution. I'm not good on details, but I'm going to make sure people are with me that are good on details because it's all about, I believe, execution. You can have a great idea go horribly wrong if it's not executed well. Number six, stand up for tolerance and diversity and strong character. Be brave because the world will test you. It's tested you already and will continue to test you. Number seven, never accept no for an answer. I, I like Winston Churchill's quote, never, never, never give in. Never, 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 never give in. I would have added a few more nevers, but otherwise it's a perfect quote. You will get a no everywhere, particularly when you are running on the business side of global operation. People will always find a reason not to do it. Number eight, master technology. I don't need to tell you that. I'm sure you've done it already, but we are probably living in the greatest revolution, I believe, in the history of humanity. And we're still in the transition, and it's, it's incredible. I mean, we have all these revolutions in the past, industrial, my kids are studying now, but this is what's happening now is changing everything. Disruption, disruption of music industry a long time ago, print, newspapers, uh, magazines, uh, my industry, television, is poised to have major, major disruption. Education will probably be last because, you know, that's just the way it is, but we are living in a world of change, and I believe it's so important to stay ahead of it, be on top of technology. I used to say back in the days of cable TV, hey, it's great, we will bring the world to your living room. Now, we will bring the world to your pocket, and it is a smart computer, phone, whatever you want to call it, that's in your pocket. Number nine, maybe the most important, have fun. Just have fun. Life's too short otherwise, and I know you've heard this before, but family and friends last longer than the job. I'm here to say, it lasts longer than the job. And number 10, do something good. I've talked enough about it with the initiatives that, that we've done over the years. And um, one more. No matter how much pressure you have in the business world, assuming now you're gonna be major CEOs, <laughs> always remember your roots. Stay creative. And with that, I think I'll end, and uh, we can open it to questions and answers if you like. Thank you. May I ask the first question? I mean, since we all will have this book when we walk out of this, and actually a book for the friends also. 
Um, you just uh, uh, had your top 10 list of uh, what's really important, what you're focused on. There's one uh, aspect in this top 10 your new book will be about. Can you talk about it? Uh, we don't have a title yet, but um, you know, by the way, it's interesting when you write a book, um, certainly in my case, it's an infrastructure that writes it, it does everything, and you're just kind of like a piece of the puzzle. So we don't have a title. We don't even have a subject yet. <laughs> but it looks like it's going to be um, intelligent perseverance. And we may entitle it Never, Never, Never Give In. Um, and it's about persevering, really, for success, but doing it in a smart way. Because you can persevere in a not smart way. So that's kind of a snapshot. Yeah. I, th I think it's really uh, uh, important because we creative people, we are only creative if we are leaving the norm. And when we're leaving the norm, we hear all the no's, you know, and how to deal with that. Uh, so, but only, it's not creative. I mean, if we repeat what's existing, yeah, it's not creative. So we will not make a step further and uh, have the chance for innovation to create new behavior or so. So I'm really looking forward, I mean, have, having read that book, yeah, got a lot of advice. Yeah. So uh, please, oh, let's open the floor. Where are your questions? I haven't, I'm, if, if I can't articulate, but you'll know what I'm talking about. <laughs> when you started uh, MTV, uh, uh, photographers have usage rights. M music has usage rights. There was a big thing. How did you convince those guys to let go of the music, to let them play it, to say, this is an ad for your brand. You're going to sell more, more albums as a result of this. Because mm. I'm sure that at the time, David Bowie, China Girl, or any of those first videos that came out, uh, the record companies weren't ready to just give it away. Mm -hmm. How, who negotiated that deal? And I just thought that was a huge paradigm shift and just changed everything in the terms of usage and probably was the initial destruction of the, uh, the, the record business. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm just interested to hear you talk about that. Okay. Well, it actually is a, is a great question. Um, and I do cover it in my book as well because it was, it's, a, it's a little bit of a saga. Um, first of all, I didn't start MTV. I, I started outside the U.S. Uh, there were some hotshots in, in uh, New York who started MTV. Um, so I can't claim credit. <laughs> but um, the mu when the record companies saw how successful MTV was in the U.S., they said, well, you know, we're not going to let that happen outside the U.S. And uh, so I can talk about this now, but this was like oh, hush hush uh, for many long years. Uh, they insisted on a deal that really held me up until I was about ready to flick the switch and launch that was 20% of the revenue. Even though we sold the records for them, we promoted it, they were not 20% of the bottom line, 20% of the revenue. So when I did my long-term business plans, there was no way the business was sustainable with that number. But I had to sign it in order to launch, launch MTV Europe way back when. So I, I went with it. And, um, and then it became so layered. It wasn't only the record companies. You, you had uh, performing rights societies. You had mechanical rights societies. It was layered. Every country had a different society. I spent the majority of my first two years just getting rights. And often I didn't get it right, but, uh, you know, over time. So what finally happened with the record companies, because they wouldn't budge, is that um, I took them to the EU. And then the EU took forever to decide. And then I took them to court. I sued them. Hmm. Not supposed to sue your major supplier, but I did. So it was a risk, but we won. So we broke the logjam. We didn't have to go through the funnel of negotiating all rights from the whole music industry. We could negotiate individually. Once we did that, the dam broke and we were able to get much better rights. And then by that time, we had so much distribution that the record companies realized, hey, this is pretty good. So we're going to, but we always paid. We didn't pay that much. And we got a good deal, of course, because we got weekly inventory of new product, which was, you know, and then the quality went up. So it was an excellent question. It was, it was one of my biggest challenges, actually. But we ended up resolving it, not without a lot of heartache and stress and hard work. <laughs> I have one more question. You built a wonderful network here, a great success, and MTV was an empire. And then it collapsed, and it disappeared even behind the paywall here in Germany. MTV is virtually non-existent, it has disappeared. What went wrong if you compare that with your 10 management rules? Yeah. Well, um, uh, if you'll allow me, I'll quote my child, my children, 
They said, Daddy, MTV's not what it used to be when you were there. <laughs> That's why I dad asking the question. <laughs> A lot of things change in the business, and um, you know Germany's not the only one. We went through a change in Russia and Brazil, likewise. Uh, um, the new management, um, the new CEO, if you will, of MTV International is much smarter than I am, and he has really increased the P&L numbers, and he's done it by making some really smart decisions. And believe it or not, you know, while I'm not intimately familiar with all the details in Germany, um, we, we were not getting a pay, there's two revenue streams primarily, advertising and pay. The pay did not exist in Germany. And because MTV ratings, and this all happened after I left, so I'm speaking a little bit out of turn, um, went down, um, it was better to build a subscription base up from scratch. Now the problem with that, which goes against my instincts 25 years ago, which is I want MTV everywhere, is that your brand suffers because you're not, don't, you don't have as much distribution. But believe it or not, that and also what was done in Brazil and Russia, very similar, um, works much better from a bottom line. So they're making more money. <laughs> they're more fiduciary responsible. And as a shareholder, I support it. <laughs> but you know, I mean, I want uh, to build on that. I mean, if you just think about the two billion people you have, and when you think about Facebook has one billion, have you guys ever thought about setting up a network that creates communication amongst the users? I yeah. mean, a Facebook? Yeah. Well, we, we uh, you know, the old cliche, the uh, innovator's dilemma. Uh, Clay Christensen from Harvard, he captures it perfectly. You, every well-established company with high margins that's very successful is blocked from innovating and something like that because it cannibalizes. But I think almost every media company was very slow. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we thought we were a little bit ahead of it, but we got caught in the bust in 2000. We had a separate internet company that talked a lot about these things, mm -hmm. you know, not only social net. We almost bought MySpace, came that close. Mm -hmm. um, you, know, you know, which may have worked out better if it was executed There's properly. A lot of musicians on it, yeah? MySpace yeah, well, it yeah, but it, it, then it was, the, it was much bigger than Facebook. Yeah. Um, but we didn't buy it. Um, Murdoch beat us to the punch at the last minute. That's a whole other story. So a lot of things were discussed. We missed a lot of things. Yeah, but we also did well on a lot of things, too. But yeah, gosh, if we had the social networking that uh, Facebook has become. But Facebook is a whole different story. You know, it's executed. So look what's happened to them recently. They were sort of you know, going down, 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 and boom. They, they, they uh, knocked it out of the park with the mobile advertising. So you know, they're, they're good. So yes. Traditional companies aren't so good at coming up with new technologies, in this case, Thanks in the, the internet answer. world. Hello. Uh, you said in the beginning of your, your, your speech, that in the beginning you just said uh, the matter was not, you, you need the, the MTV in every house, you need to build the brand. And then you build relevance for the brand, and then you make money. But now when he asked about uh, what happened, you said now the money is they earn more money mm -hmm. than you use, but you were, they were, you're not, but <laughs> they were losing relevance. At least in Brazil, we have a, 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 a MTV has changed a lot this year. They changed the direction of the... Where, in, where are you talking about? I'm talking Brazil? about Brazil, Brazil yeah. right now, yeah. yeah. They lost a lot of re relevance, and you see at all, in all the parts of the world, the relevance of the MTV is not the same as it used to be in the yeah. 90s. And so I would ask, you, it's quite the same question he did, but would be when MTV starts to lose relevance, because in Brazil we saw the, the channel trying to change in new ways and try to, there was once the, 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 the leader of the MTV in Brazil said the music was not important. So in MTV it's not, well, it's not about music. He used mm -hmm. to say it was a very big problem in the time for marketing in Brazil. So I would like to know where do you start to lose relevance and how does it affect the brand even if the bottom line is still growing up? Yeah, well, that's a good question, too. You know, the, the, um, uh, my philosophy in the early days, I've talked about it and it's in the book, was I wanted to be everywhere. I wanted to develop the brand, revenues come later. And um, over time, that became more controversial in my own organization uh, because it was more profit-driven. That's, that's what companies do, they, they make money. And uh, so, you know, I ended up being somewhat outnumbered sometimes. You know, I wanted MTV to be, uh, in, pick a country, the smallest possible country. I just wanted it everywhere. Because intuitively, 
I, I, I spent a lot of time, I talked about the behind the Iron Curtain. There was no commercial um, advantage for being behind the Iron Curtain until, oh, I don't know, five to ten years later. But I felt intuitively that if you establish the brand, it's eventually going to pay off. Same thing with the Soviet Union. There was no reason to be in this. There was no commercialism. But I really in, intuitively wanted to be there. So I do basically agree with the premise of your question. Uh, but uh, over time, uh, um, you know, MTV's changed. And MTV, you don't go to for music videos anymore, obviously. Uh, there's a lot of you know, great, wonderful reality programs like Jersey Shore. <laughs> Um, and I, of course, I'm the old school. I miss the music. But um, you get high, they get higher ratings. And, uh, you know, they, they still have some amazing events on, on the music side. And, uh, and remember that MTV is not, MTV Networks is not MTV only. It's a portfolio of brands. Nickelodeon, wow. You know, number one children's channel for, I don't know, almost since day one. They went through a little dip like, two years ago, but now they're back. So that actually is, in many ways, financially a more, the most successful brand. Comedy Central, huge, huge brand. And there's Paramount movies, and, and then there's brand extensions for all those uh, mother, uh, those main brands. So the portfolio, yeah, and, I, and I do think that MTV is a little bit off the zeitgeist uh, uh, compared to what it was maybe 20 years ago, but it's still, in many ways, it's even more successful. So, but I, I, I do think you make a good point that when do you draw the line between short-term profits and building a brand? And it's tough. You know, it's a tough decision, and you've got to use good judgment, and you have to fit into the corporate goals of P&L. And these, I'm just glad I'm out of it, and I'm glad you have to solve these problems, and I don't. <laughs> Hi, there are two things. Um, first, I wanted to say that I was an intern uh, in the international department at MTV in 1988. 88? 88. Wow. Um, and the thing that I thought was uh, really great about MTV was that I'd never been into a, a creative environment like that before. It was just, it was uh, unlike anything that I had ever experienced and still today. Um, the two things I wanted to ask you were, your background in the military and the connection or jump to MTV. What was that like and were there parallels with challenges? And the second thing you talked about was the early MTV days and if, could you elaborate on certain things that, uh, that you can draw on to make sort of uh, something that happened then that, that could make or resonate with the audience now? Well, the military, you know, obviously that's the unplanned, unpredictable part about my life. And no one, everyone still makes fun of me. You know, how do you go from nuclear missiles to music videos? It's kind of weird. But um, I, I always had it in my blood that I would work in a, something that I love. That's why I do the caveat of, you know, love what you do, do what you love. I didn't really love the 11 years I was in the military. It was, it was a bit of a chore. Um, it was public service, so that I took some satisfaction out of. But I, you know, didn't jump up every morning and say, "Yeah, yeah." Uh, it, it, you know, it, so I always knew I would go into media, and uh, the military um, turns out to be very valuable lessons for me. I wasn't smart enough to realize it at the time, but when I started writing my book, I realized, "Wow, I learned more from the military than I thought." So, for example, the organization. I designed the international structure, which you know, eventually went all around the world, as a military organization. And I didn't realize it, as I said at the time, I guess I just wasn't smart enough, but um, small fighting units and uh, trying to minimize the bureaucracy, particularly as we got big, keeping the communication lines opening, local employees completely, profit and accountability at the local level, being able to respond to the enemy quickly in this case, competition, being able to relate to the population, in this case, the audience, much better, and um, just speed up decisions. And also, by only having only, you know, 100 and some of our channels, maybe 200, you could build a, a culture that truly reflected not only your audience, but made it um, closer. Everyone knew themselves by first name, and you could just work more quickly. I'm not a big fan, well, no one is. Bureaucracy, I think, is a creativity killer. So by having small fighting units around the world, 
you solve that problem somewhat of the bureaucracy. So the military actually taught me a lot, and I didn't even know it. And on the leadership side, you know, the battlefield thing, we were just taught, hey, first one the battlefield, last one to leave. And, and uh, I think that works in a crisis situation too. So um, I was so determined to make these channels local, totally local. And by the way, the new management is, again, smarter than me because I didn't have scale. And you need to have scale. And I, you know, it was so decentralized, I, I missed um, largely on the scale side. But anyway, the big mistake was not so much that. It was that I gave so much um, authority in, in my decentralization that first thing I would do when I travel around the world is go in the hotel room, make sure they have MTV. If they don't, I checked out. And uh, tell them, you know, I won't come back until you get MTV. Or sometimes they do it on the spot, believe it or not, fooling with a dish. And uh, I would turn on MTV. So on one of my trips to Taiwan, I turn on MTV, and uh, it's in the morning, it's like eight o'clock in the morning, and it's, uh, it was, took a red eye, and it's like um, wrestling. So I'm thinking, oh, okay, maybe they like wrestling in Taiwan, you know, no, no big deal, wrestling on MTV. And then uh, I started watching a little longer, and it was nude male wrestling. Uh, <laughs> and I said, oh, maybe I had taken this uh, localization thing a little too far. <laughs> So I called the GM up right and said, what the hell are you doing? Uh, so we had to get that one off. Um, when I went to China um, for the first time, they sat me down, early 90s, and said, you can do business here as long as you don't commit to three T's. And you know, stupid me, what are the three T's? So they told me, Tiananmen Square, um, Taiwan, and Tibet. And uh, you stay away from that, you're fine. So what do I do over the next 90 days? I have a free Tibet concert on. I have a video with Taiwan soldiers. And um, the big one was Tiananmen Square. So each time I had to have an apology trip to China. Uh, the, I'll tell you qu quickly, the, the fun one of that is Tiananmen Square. We all remember the classic picture of the, the student in front of the tank. I have it hanging on my wall. I would take it down when the Chinese came, but I have it on my wall. Um, and uh, you know, cult, you've got to be respect and reflect, right? So um, remember the Janet Jackson? Crises, many of you may not. Well, okay, our sister company, CBS, sold the uh, Super Bowl to China live for the first time. And MTV, uh, because we were a sister company, was going to produce an A spot. We were going to do it and in the programming. And at the last minute, the NFL said, no, not going to allow. It's not you know, positive enough. So we were kind of bummed out. But um, we gave to a very, you'll relate to this, a very junior producer, because we didn't even really care too much anymore. Just come up with anything. You know, we got two minutes, we can do something. So the junior producer, <laughs> I shouldn't say junior, the producer came up with this two minute uh, montage of stuff. And for 0 .06 seconds in that montage was the person in front of the tank. And it went all across China. And this was the same halftime show that Janet Jackson, you know, we, our CEOs almost got fired because of the Justin Timberlake ripping the thing off Janet Jackson. I don't know if you remember this, you know, with Janet Jackson's breast and, you know, the whole thing was like a huge scandal. Huge. Well, in China, of course, they didn't notice Janet Jackson's breast. <laughs> All they saw was 0 .0 seconds of this person in front of the tank. We were kicked off the systems. I had to make a personal visit to explain. And as I came back on the plane, you know, even though I went through all the motions, I said, you know, I feel pretty good because I was told this is the first time that image has ever been shown in China. So I know it's not culturally respect and reflect, but I kind of I kind of got a thrill out of that. <laughs> so that was, a, you know, there's countless mistakes. I took my owner once to China, Sumner Redstone, the big boss, and uh, we were celebrating the launch of MTV China. Wow. You know, in Mandarin, a totally localized channel in the Hall of the Great Peoples with the president of China, China, Jiang Zemin. And we had the long banquet. We got hundreds of people. We're giving our toast. And uh, Sumner Redstone's sitting here, and the president's sitting over there. And um, as I'm getting ready to give my toast, offering great respect to this amazing hall of leaders in China, I hear my owner, Sumner Redstone, shouting across the table to the president of China, I've had better Chinese food in New York. <laughs> so we had to have a follow-up meeting the next day on that one. Um, I'm really interested to know a little bit about the today's media landscape because you... The today's what? Today's media landscape. Yes. Because you touched on it in your speech and I can't help but be a bit cynical. You sounded very positive about it. You're talking about disruption 
And um, one of the interesting points you made was the fact that a lot of the, um, you, you felt like the MTV contributed to the short attention span generation. But I think that these people grow up kind of inventing the technologies which make us kind of very short attention span at the same time. So I'm just interested to know a little bit more about your opinion of what today's landscape looks like and where yeah. it's heading because I think a lot of people feel like they know where it's heading but then I believe them less, you know, because I just, I don't trust them because there's so much technology that's coming and going yeah. and everyone thinks that they know where it's going and there's just, you know, it kind of comes up and goes and it goes in layers and yeah. the other question I had for you, I hope that's okay if I can that's follow That's a big question You're, by the way, just that one. Okay, <laughs> do you want to stick with that question then? No, you can go ahead. But I'm I have a, a really quick a one, one I just wanted to sneak in. Um, I'm really interested in your transition from um, M uh, MTV to the health world and was it because you were a little bit more cynical about the media landscape world and you felt like you wanted to contribute a little bit more to I, I don't want to say the legitimate problems of the world, but from maybe Jersey Shore to the, to the health world in, in such. And I'm really interested to know, like, did you feel like you wanted to kind of give back a bit more the kind of reciprocity of, yeah. of it all? And I'm really interested in those two things. Okay. Well, those are two very Sorry, deep, deep questions. Yeah. I'll try and keep it short MTV style <laughs> um, because they're, they could go on for a long time. But let me do the second one uh, just quickly. Um, I, I had public service first in my career, which was the military. And then I kind of went to this fun job. But you know, th th these jobs that they sound fun, they're actually very serious businesses, even though I was blessed to work in this environment of creativity for, for so long. The global health uh, involvement came a long time ago. And uh, it started in the 90s, actually, uh, when we started putting AIDS messages on MTV, long time ago. And then uh, we extended it to ways to quit smoking, drug abuse, you know, voting. We ran voting campaigns and, in countries that never had elections up until that point, which was quite interesting, Russia being one of them. But the, the thing about um, AIDS was I established a relationship, actually, back in 1998. He was just with me Saturday night with the first executive director of UNAIDS. His name is Dr. Peter Piot, an amazing person, co-founder of the Ebola virus, got tons of credentials. And um, he, he made me an ambassador for the United Nations, which I am until this day. Has nothing to do with me. He was smart enough to realize, am I getting feedback? Sorry. Um, that um, by making me an ambassador, he, we were going to deliver the, the channel, the <coughs> network of literally millions of people around the world. And in his words, MTV could save more lives than doctors. And he was a doctor, so you know, we let him say it. And uh, that was really the start of a long relationship that just started building and building. I started the Global Business Coalition, which aggregated all business against AIDS. Um, and then, you know, this sort of has a tipping point because I was one of the few in the private sector that really jumped into it in such a way. Kofi Annan appointed me as a global media AIDS um, uh, leader, which meant I brought all the media companies together and made them commit to uh, 30 seconds, doesn't sound like a lot, but 30 seconds in prime time to an AIDS message, all major TV companies around the world. And then it kind of went on and on and on, all these different things, and it, it didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen overnight. But when I left, um, it turned out that I had this circle, if you will, of relationships and friends. So it was almost a logical extension, and I just jumped in it a little bit more. Amphar was new, Gavi was new, and yeah, maybe it is a, a response to uh, taking Jersey Shore around the world. I don't know. Um, but MTV does other good things, too, besides you know, uh, reality programming, of course. Um, but I think it makes me feel better, um, because I'm at a stage where I've already had 40 years of media, so I didn't want to jump into another CEO job. And anyway, that's the second question. First question, uh, first question. Where's the media? Huh? Media, where's it headed? Oh, okay. So um, I'm often invited to give lectures about the future of TV. You know, what do I know? I'm, I'm not even working in TV anymore. Um, so I get up and talk about the future of TV. It, 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 this is kind of a long one, but the premise of your question, which is not only is it uncertain, it's changing, is in my mind true. Now, it will not change as quickly as the music business, in my mind, again, as, or TV, uh, or radio, or, I mean not radio, excuse me, print, newspaper, and magazine, because the players are so entrenched to protect this business model that they're doing everything they can, unlike those other industries. Because the business model, the cable TV business model, has produced more value than anything in media in the history of media. Literally hundreds of billions of dollars of market value. So you have a lot of people 
who are doing everything they can to prevent this big change. The big change is coming. There's no question. So what's the big change? Well, um, there are two problems as I see it in the current model. One is bundling. So in order to get a channel, you need to have 500 channels. In order to get a show, you have to have a channel. So bundling is a wonderful premise if you're on the receipt, receiving side. And if there was no bundling, your revenues would shrink by at least 50% as a supplier of programming or as a cable provider. So bundling, I think, is inherently a consumer unfriendly proposition. And young people increasingly will not stand for it. They're, and not only the value, but just the inconvenience. So increasingly, people want any program, any time, without you know, paying all this excess money. That's problem number one. Problem number two, advertising. This is the world we know so well, right? Well, it's been largely smoke and mirrors for about 50 years. And um, it's quite extraordinary, really, when you think about it. Um, how the industries have received such a buy on delivering specific viewers. Now, they do deliver viewers, but it's never what is said. Up until recently, now we have full information. And it's going to get even more thorough with the smart box. Not the smartphone, but the smart box in the home will tell an advertiser everything. So the advertiser will finally realize that, hey, you know, Maybe it doesn't make sense to do this or do that from there. So they're going to be much smarter, and businesses need to be much smarter how they, imp how they um, uh, insert um, the creative message for an advertisement. So this is another threat, I believe, to the current players. What I think is going to happen, I think it's going to be a lot less channels, consolidation. I think eventually there's obviously multiple devices. Um, you know, my kids uh, hardly ever watch TV. They hardly ever watch TV. They watch, you know, they'll order something from iTunes, but they'll hardly ever watch a television show. They don't tolerate commercials in their present form, even though some of the commercials are great. And so all this is going to take a lot of creativity. There is a lot of uncertainty, but to me, the only uncertainty is how fast it'll change. Bill, uh, to that, uh, an extension to the question, how do you feel about net Netflix uh, yeah. uh, regarding the future of television. Okay, so when uh, Netflix started changing their strategy a year ago, um, this, was, this was a great thing. You know, you're never too old to learn. I said, what a terrible mistake. Their strategy was we're going to produce original programming. And coming from HBO in the early days, I know how hard that is, and of course MTV. It's hard to make hits. Uh, the studios have been around for 100 years. They still screw it up with you know, movies that are sometimes bombs every once in a while. So anyway, so Netflix comes out with their big program a year ago. And I made fun of it, House of Cards, ha, 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 House of Cards, um, because I saw Netflix um, as a perfect undercutting price, $6 a month, and you get all this great inventory. Stay there, what a great business. You'll just layer it on top of your pay TV. So, of course, they didn't listen to my advice. They went out and produced House of Cards. <laughs> and what does House of Cards do? It becomes a mega hit. It gets nominated for Emmys. It's unbelievable. People do binge viewing. They subscribe to Netflix. And, you know, so the analysts, how short-sighted the analysts can be in the investment world, they say, well, how much money did you make on House of Cards? They didn't make any money on House of Cards, but they built the brand, and when they released their numbers of the quarter after House of Cards was shown on Netflix, they had a two million growth rate in subscribers. So what did that do? It raised the stock value like $10 billion. So, did House of Cards make money? I think so. So I call that one wrong. <laughs> and, and to me, that's a perfect example of the chaos theory. Uh, because it didn't really make much sense, I didn't think, to jump into original programming because they had a nice business model. But hey, you had a guy, Reed Hastings, who was going to do it. And he, was gonna, he executed it well. And it's a winner. So you never know. So to answer your question, I think Netflix has a very bright history. <laughs> I mean, excuse me, very bright. It's not only Netflix, by the way. It's a bunch of others. Uh, the big two that we're all waiting on is Google and Apple. Apple's already in it, but those are the two that I think, you know, the two big gorillas that's going to change everything. It's actually also a race in quality in, in, in television because they really produce well and, and they have great actors involved and, and you know, yes. I mean, it's, it's kind of a, a difference that benefits television in the future. Absolutely. Yeah? And as a content producer, you're very happy about added distribution. I, any uh, other platform that joins on the internet side, hmm. uh, you can, uh, a content producer has to be careful not to upset the relationships on the cable, 
but more distribution is good yeah. for content. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you could talk about the tension between um, marketing and uh, global health, because you've been in both worlds, and uh, specifically wanted to get at the issue of um, some of the things you, you, you raised that uh, one needs to admit failure, you can't just talk about success stories, that you have to focus on the actual implementation, that the plan is not enough. Um, these seem to me to be two very important issues in global health, and there's a big fear in general from institutions, from UN institutions, from government institutions, from NGOs, of ever admitting any kind of failure and saying, or, or anything less than a real success and a really positive message. But in fact, you know, doing these things is really hard. Um, I mean, AIDS on prevention, uh, for every one person who's getting drugs, two to three more are getting infected. I mean, this is a terrible situation. So. And, and yet, when so much of uh, communications and media around global health, uh, you know, it tends to be very sort of positive focused. And, it, and you know, I, I guess at the end of the day, it's a, it, to me, it's a quite different thing than a, than a business because if something fails, it's not that you're losing money, it's that, you know, people, people are losing their lives. Mm -hmm. So can, if you could just, I guess, talk about your, you know, reflect on that tension as, as you see it. Yeah. Uh, by the way, when you opened the question, I thought you were going to say the tension between marketing and programming, <laughs> which I have a specific example of when I first started my career. Um, yeah, I, I think um, increasingly global health is under a lot of scrutiny uh, because we're dealing with large sums of money. And when you deal with large sums of money, some of it gets corrupted. Uh, one of the beauties, by the way, about the vaccine initiative I'm involved in is that dictators, if you will, do not store vaccines. <laughs> you know, so there's, you know, that we've got a big uh, advantage for that one. But uh, there's been a long history of corruption and missed um, opportunities and money leaking from the system. And you know, it's why Bono says today in all his initiatives that he works as hard on anti-corruption as he does in relieving debt with, with the countries. So yeah, there is that dynamic. There's no question. The the um, but, I'm sorry, just, I'm not speaking specifically about corruption, just that, that, you know, just when you're rolling out any sort of big global health plan, it just, it never goes the way you expect. It's like anything. I mean, there's right. all sorts of creeks. I don't even mean corruption, just the normal problems one has in implementation. Yeah. Well, I think you're also right, and this is what we battle on the aid side, the complacency. Because, yeah, the numbers are down. There's less uh, HIV infections, uh, forgive me, I think they're, da, 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 da. they were as high as 2.3, now they're probably, I think, 1.7 million. Um, deaths are down, you know, again, 2.7, down to high teens. Uh, so there's, but then, for every person who gets treatment, you're absolutely right, I think it's, I think it's down to about two, um, get newly infected. So, you know, it's technically still out of control. The epidemic is still out of control. But you deal uh, a lot with um, fatigue in this world with these issues, and um, it's really hard. Uh, so um, that's why at MTV we try to really cut through it. We even used humor, believe it or not, on some of our um, marketing, if you will, just to get people to watch. And we have, um, for example, this program in Kenya called Sugar, uh, Sugar Daddy, which um, is like a gossip girl, Africa gossip girl, gets 70% rating. Um, so, because it's fun to watch. It's very racy, which you know they're not used to in the culture, but you watch it. And when you watch it, sneaking in are these key, these key um, uh, messages. And uh, the next thing we're doing is putting testing centers right next to screening. So when you watch it, we're measuring how many people actually go and get tested, because that's a direct behavioral change that we're looking for. But uh, no, to, to, to your point, there is tension. And uh, it's, it's not a rosy story. I do get very excited when I talk about vaccines, because that's one that I think is just r really, really doing very well. And, but they have problems too, of course. And, and uh, you know, global health, though, I do think, generally speaking, with all the issues that we're dealing with worldwide, you know, I've talked about some in poverty, climate change, don't have solutions yet to those. Some of the global health ones are making some progress. And it, this is important, by the way, because I learned uh, just last week from this demographic instructor, he's on YouTube, forgive me, I forget his name, but I'll remember. Um, yes, wonderful, wonderful. Can you say his name again? Hans Rosling. 
Yeah, do, do a YouTube, you know, That's because right. um, he gives a 17 minute demographic thing. It's really quite amazing. So he taught, so you're, this is just birth rates and mortality. Um, Europe is flat for the foreseeable future, a billion. The Americans are flat, a billion. Um, China, uh, excuse me, Asia continues to go up, but not as much as they have in the past. And this is population growth. Africa doubles and then doubles again. So he projects, oh, I don't know, 50 years or so, 80% of the world's population is coming from Africa and Asia. African Asia, 80%. So it's even more imperative that we get the children not only vaccinated, but educated. Educated, because they're going to be playing a big role in this world. And it's a very compelling uh, uh, presentation. I would encourage you to watch it. Now he's also great in presentations. I mean, the techniques he uses, the dynamic charts and so forth. Hans Roslin, yeah? Yes. One more question. I have um, another question on demographics. I mean, as you said, your children don't, don't look television. So I assume the television viewer gets older, older and older. And the internet um, viewer, YouTube viewer, um, is the younger generation. So what do you think has television to do to get the younger viewer back on the channel? Yeah. Well, the, the kids do watch television. It's just that they don't watch it in the old model. They watch it a la carte. And, uh, I do think even with all the resistance to change, that's eventually where it's going to go. The people will watch, I, I actually think there's a surplus of good content, believe it or not. I mean, how many times have you been told you got to watch the box set of this, you know? I, I, I'm still working on The Sopranos, you know? Um, uh, what, what is it, uh, Walking Dead, what's the big one, Breaking Bad? You know, and then of course you say, I say, can I jump in at season five? Says, no, you got to watch season one. You know, there's no way. There is such a surplus of quality programming. So the, I think people are still watching more than ever. It's just that the old business model of watching it with commercials and at this particular time, that's going to go, I believe, is going to go away. I think we wrap it up here. Uh, it was, uh, I think, a very rich question and answer session. Um, we have something for you, Bill. Uh, which you probably will like a lot. It's Berlin from one side of the wall and the other side of the wall. And uh, you've contributed that it came down, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you for thank your time. And thank, thank you all you. for coming. Great questions.